Um, glad to see everybody here this morning. Um, this is Mr. Preston. And we're going to be talking about uh, building chatbot. And we've got a lot of other pieces going in there too. So, um, thanks very much. I will, before I really get started, I, I sat through enough sessions yesterday where the instructor like introduced the session, the title, all themselves, and then had to do it all over again for the video because I hadn't hit record yet. So I'll, I'll get the thumbs up from the guy in the back. All right, there it is. There's the thumbs up so we can get started. So my name is Hank Preston. I'm a developer evangelist with Cisco's DevNet organization. How many people have ever heard of Cisco before? Yeah. How many people actively use Cisco at something in their organization today? A phone? Yeah, that's good enough. Yeah. Right, raise my hand. How many people act, use Cisco somewhere in their organization today? There's, there's a few. And those that don't probably just don't know it. We're usually buried someplace in there. How many people think about Cisco when you think about developer experience, APIs, and, and all of that? Anybody? Yeah, no, I know. Yeah, we're trying really hard. So that's actually what my job is. I work with DevNet, which is our developer ecosystem and program. If you're familiar with MSDN, Microsoft Developer Network, API, or, uh, Amazon's obviously got theirs, DevNet is Cisco's. And Cisco's been around for many years, but we've really, um, only in the last handful, really adopted and understood the importance of the developer platform. Because frankly, for a while, most people just wanted to buy our stuff, plug it in, and make sure it did what it was supposed to do. But today, everything in technology is about being a platform, being able to extend capabilities in technology, and nobody is happy with what you get out of the box anymore. And so DevNet is how Cisco is out there providing all of the things that developers need to get started. And I have the wonderful job of being a part of the team that gets to do this type of stuff, right? Developer outreach evangelism, let people know what's out there. And so that's what we're going to spend some time today, is talking through some of those. Let me get rid of this gun, which is a terrible thing to still have in my mouth as I've already started. So let's dive in. So the session today, build a chatbot with Chuck Norris, Python, and Docker. I put Chuck Norris in there purely for the seats. Okay. How many people came simply because Chuck Norris was in the title? Yeah, it's okay. You can everybody's there on purpose, right? I'm a professional presenter, so we know how we go through on that. But hopefully, you'll learn a little bit about some of these other topics as we go through the day. All right, so let's try that. A little bit about me. So Hank Preston, I call myself a technologist and a performer. So these are all shots of me in the last year doing what I love to do, which is talk about technology or just have a good time up on a stage someplace. So some of the core values I have, I actually sat through a session yesterday. I was the first one that went through. It was like how to help your manager be a better leader. I don't see him here. But he did a great job talking through and he, he had like, what are your beliefs? Make sure people know what, you're, what you believe. And so these are mine. I think technology is amazing. Frankly, it changes the, everything in the world when it goes through. And secondly, technology should be fun. For a long time, I've been at Cisco, you can see my, my years back here for a while, but I'd be out talking with people in technology and I would just see grumpy faces everywhere. Nobody seemed to be enjoying technology anymore. And so I personally believe it should be fun. If it's not, then something is wrong. And we should go after that. Your work should be enjoyed. I know not everybody can enjoy your job, but if you have an opportunity to enjoy what you're doing, gosh darn it, go for it. And try to enjoy what you're doing. And then learning should also be fun. Um, I present and I do education by trade as part of my job, and I've seen too many people get up there and do like the, 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 the monotone, deliver a presentation, have an audience all looking at their laptops doing nothing, and I vowed if I was gonna deliver content ever in my career, I wanted to make sure everybody was enjoying what they're after. So those are my core values. How I achieved where I'm at today, so why you should talk to me, is I actually graduated undergraduate in 2001, with a degree in psychology and theater, which promptly, yeah, which promptly turned into a, a couple of career jobs. I actually did professional theater for a little while, musicals, rock concerts, that type of thing, and then that's a night job, if you didn't know. And so I started taking computer college classes just to kill time during the day, coding, web design, development, like that, and I realized two things fairly quickly. One, hours are way better in technology, and two, the pay is also quite a bit better. And so I left and I started becoming an IT consultant in 2003. I moved on, uh, kept with the schooling, got a master's in information systems with a focus on database development and engineering design. So I did a lot of web development, DBA stuff, stuff like that. And then I started, you'll notice I moved into infrastructure from development. So I come out of schooling with a development background and then I purely realized very quickly that I am not a fan of Java. <laughs> God, I hated Java development. And so I said, you know what, it's time to move on and go to infrastructure. I still like technology, I don't want to like lose it all, but I'm just tired of Java. So I did infrastructure for a handful of years, which brought me to Cisco. 
That's where I came in. I came in as a network engineer, a uh, systems engineer, helping people with their infrastructure pieces. And then cloud and data centers and all these things became so relevant, so my background in development became really valuable to go out and talk with customers. In 2013, I discovered Python, and I realized that development doesn't have to suck anymore. Right? Java is not the only thing out there. You can write stuff and things that are entertaining. And then that brought me to 2016 in my dream job, which is what I get to do full time now, which is help people understand technology and have a good time doing it. I'm pretty excited so far. So that nobody's left yet, and you're like, what the hell is this? Going on? All right, so what is our agenda for today? So we've got a good chunk of time, nearly two hours to go through this. So these are the bullet points we're going to hit. Um, how many people have ever heard of Cisco Spark before? All right, so it's not everybody in the room, so I'm going to have to do a bit of an intro so you even know why. I knew Chuck Norris would bring people in. Cisco Spark might scare people away. So we'll talk real briefly about what Cisco Spark is and what it is and why you might want to take some of the skills away and use them in your real life job after that. That won't take long, and then we're going to get into some of the lab preparation and prereqs. Did anybody come today to a coding tutorial at Pi Ohio and not bring a laptop? I've had it happen. I've had it happen. All right, so you all have laptops, so the first prereq is, is handled. We'll then go through the anatomy of a Spark bot, which is actually the anatomy of any bot. I don't care what you're writing, whether you're writing it from uh, Facebook or Slack or, or any of those other platforms. They all generally work the same way, so we'll go through the general architecture there. And then we'll dive into the actual piece. So we're going to look at the Cisco SparkBot Python library. We'll see how it works, and then we'll use it to very rapidly stand up a functioning SparkBot. Everybody in the room will be turned functioning SparkBot. And then we'll start to dissect it and add new capabilities as we go through. The one we're going to focus on is Chuck Norris via the API. My personal favorite API on the internet is the Chuck Norris API. So we'll take a look at that and how we can implement it. We'll then look at, once our bot is working, we've got them developed, they're running on our laptops, we'll look at how we can package that up as a Docker image so that you can actually make it portable. If you wanted your bot to live on uh, indefinitely, you could take your Docker image, post it someplace on the internet, make it available. And then at the end, we're gonna talk about how you add new bot commands. So if we get through all of that and we still have time, I'm hoping that everybody will kind of go through, we're gonna put hands down, we'll do more coding, and we'll see what extra things we can teach our bot to do as far as that goes. Everybody still excited? Anybody want to get up and leave and go do something else after that? No? Good for you. That was a little scary. So intro to Cisco Spark. So if you already know what Cisco Spark is, that's fine. Go check Twitter, tweet about how it hangs up there talking about something. That's cool. But for those that don't, Cisco Spark, the industry's most advanced collaboration suite. I want the reverb on the echo to go through there. Um, it really is just a, the next generation Cisco collaboration platform built uh, in a modern fashion, it's web UI, it's, it's all focused on the user, and it, is, it offers these capabilities, meeting, messaging, and calling. So you can hold uh, virtual meetings, you can do messaging, which is a high part of what it's used, and that's our focus for today is around bots, but it also does both voice and video calling. So it's kind of the full collaboration platform targeting mostly enterprise users, that is Cisco's target audience. It's user-centric, and that's a little different than some of the other ones that are out there. It's not centered on a team, it's not centered on a particular event, it's all about the user. So the user logs into the system, they have an account, and then they can join and participate in whatever they want to go for that. But what it was actually built to be more than anything else is this platform across any device. So whether you're on a mobile device from Apple or Android or some other manufacturer, you're in a room, you're on a phone on your desk, You've got a big whiteboard solution. It's a single platform, a single, single capability from Cisco to cover all of these solutions. It's the, the API platform, it's the development platform, which is really where it starts to shine. It's been built API first, like any good software today should be, so that you can integrate and you can add capabilities to it. So you can build it into your workflows, you can build it into all those capabilities that are there. There's plugins for Box and Office, we've got Zendesk, we've got Salesforce plugins, all of those types of capabilities already exist, but because it's an open platform that is free to join, you'll be able to get your account, oh, don't leave, don't leave, no, don't, 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 don't. Oh, no. All right, one down. Should have done the crowd selfie when I started before you all can go away. Um, so I get, I get distracted really easily if you have this. So, What's really nice about this is you can get an account for Cisco Spark for free and you have full access to the developer API. You don't have to pay anything, you can jump right into it, which is one of the benefits when we get out there and go forward. So anybody can build an app, a bot, an integration for whatever you're after. These are some of the ones that exist already today. 
And they break into kind of two areas, integrations and bots. You want to build something into your application that is going to leverage either meetings, messaging, calling inside of your own area. Or you want to build a bot that can interact and answer questions or just tell jokes. And then we've got the APIs and the SDKs, so that it makes it easy for you to use those technologies that are out there. Some of the biggest categories that people are building, integrations and bots, kind of fall into these areas. Incident management, HR onboarding, general tasks, finance operations, content management, like the, the list could go on with why people can do these areas. Now we're going to take the simple step, right? You have to crawl before you walk, walk before you run. And so we're just going to build a very basic interactive bot that will take some input and then reply with a funny quip is really kind of the point of what we're going to go after. But the skills we use today, or you learn in the class today, you could use to integrate with anything. As long as you've got an API and an idea, you can build a bot for that. Okay? We're also not covering kind of the high end of bot pieces today, artificial intelligence, natural language processing. Those are all topics worthy of their own. We're going to stick with kind of the basic framework for bot creation today, which is command structure. Look for a command, trigger off of that, and do something. All right, that's it. That, that's, the, that's as close as I get to a marketing spiel today. But now everybody at least understands what it is this tool that we're going to be integrating with, so you can go back and have a little bit of context that goes through. So lab prereqs to go through on this. So this is PyOhio, so hopefully none of these are going to be too hard. So on your laptop, you need Python 3.6 preferred, 3.5 or 3.4 would probably work as well. Does everybody? Does anybody not have that installed yet today? All right, you got. Okay. You, if you've got Python 2, I've got some pieces you can go through on that. But I would say go to uh, python.org, downloads, grab Python 3.6. That'll be the easiest. All the code samples will work exactly as expected. Docker for whatever your platform is. If you're a Mac user, Docker for Mac. If you're a Windows user, Docker for Windows. If you're a Linux user, just Docker on those. So who's still? Who needs to go and is frantically downloading Docker now? We got plenty of time, so don't, don't worry too much. I built it all in there. Right. Yep, so hit docker.com, get docker, so you can go through on that. <coughs> and then the way the bots work, whether it's Spark or anything else, is you build some code, and that code is then responsive to requests from the internet. Because the requests come from the internet, and your code is going to run on your laptop, we need a way to put your laptop on the internet. And as great as OSU is, like all of our laptops are just publicly on the internet when you join the Wi-Fi here. That's probably really a good thing. And so we use a tool called NGROC, which is an open source tool that builds a local secure tunnel from your laptop to the internet, particularly for this type of development work that's there. How many people already have NGROC on their laptops? That's actually quite, that's way more than usual. I'm not surprised at the audience here. If you don't have it yet, hit ngroc.com slash download. Grab the download for it. It's a really simple command line utility. You can put it in a temp directory. It doesn't need to be any uh, fancy installation. Question? Do you, technically no, you wouldn't, as long as when you uh, start the Python application, you know the URL that your application is available on the internet, you could just sub that URL in instead. Okay, okay. good question. Oh yeah, I'm sorry, the question was if, if our system is actually up on the internet, we're connected to a remote development machine and it does exist on the internet, do we need any rock? And the, the answer is no, if you know how to, you're gonna run your Python application, you know what the URL it's available at is, is available, then that's fine, you wouldn't need it. So we've gone through on those pieces that are there. All right, accounts. So you do need a Cisco Spark account to do this. You're going to be building a bot uh, from your own account. So if you don't have one already, if you go to web.ciscospark.com, you'll put your email address in. It will then send you an email. It's like any other sign up. It'll send you an email. You click a button. You set up an account. It takes usually less than three minutes to, uh, to get that done. So go ahead and grab that on that. Also, if you can sign up for a DevNet account, not, while not technically needed for the session today, if you want to follow up, get code samples, run other learning labs, get other those pieces, it's kind of good to get it out of the way. It's also a little benefit for me, right? Cisco lets me come and do these things, and if I can actually prove that people listen to me and I actually showed up, that's great. So if you go to this link, cs.co slash piohio17, you're then linking yourself that you were here and gone through, and I get credit, which everybody likes credit at work, right? Right, well, I like some credit, so do me a favor. Hit the link, just hit register. If you already have a DevNet account, do it anyway, because it'll still give me the little check mark that we had somebody in the session. There's also a bonus, so I've got a few shirts up here that we're gonna give away, as well as plenty of stickers. Shirts today are for good questions or really an interesting bot creation. 
although everybody can get a shirt. So if you do sign up and go through this, if you just tweet or spark me a message showing that you signed in, give us your address, we'll ship you a shirt. And these are actually really quick cool. It is the, I will show you my API if you show me your shirt. Very clever, everybody likes one of those. So a little bit of swag so you get from just from signing up for DevNet today. Now the lab code, right? The lab code's up on GitHub, like most code these days will be found for things like this. H Preston slash lab uh, underscore Chuck Norris underscore Spark. <coughs> you can git clone that, or if you don't want to go through the whole process of git clone, you can just do like a wgit or a curl or just hit this web address, it'll download the zip file from GitHub, you can unzip it, and that'll work fine for the lab as well. Okay? I'm gonna leave this slide up for a little bit as people go through. Like I said, I built in plenty of time to make sure these ones go in, so I'll make sure that we'll do some polls occasionally as, as we go through. I'm gonna shrink it to the size a little bit so that I can do some of these prereqs myself. All right. <clears throat> can you still hear me if I try to hover over the microphone? You guys, I, I'm fairly loud, so you can probably hear me without the mic, so it's more for the recording. That is a great question. So the question was, do I need to download Cisco Spark? You can download the client if you want, but you can also just use the web client available at web.ciscospark.com, which is what I'll do for most of the demo today. Is just use the web. Okay. I'm just going to download the zip file. When you go to web.ciscospark.com, it'll ask you for, if you haven't done this already, it'll ask you for your email address, just put it in. If you don't have an account yet, it will set you up one, which involves sending you an email to confirm and all those, all that other kind of stuff. And then you can go ahead and log in. Change our registration flow a few times, and I don't have. 
like I ran out of email addresses to register new accounts with it, so it's testing a lot. Thanks. All right. We yeah. Yeah, no kidding. There's probably an API for that. Good stuff. Any other questions? Anybody having problems? Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah. What's wrong? The DevNet doesn't seem to go anywhere. Yeah. Does it just get you a getting started page? It yeah. yeah. Right. And you keep getting started, it goes, log in. You log in, you register. <laughs> Skip over. If that's causing issues, just skip it purely, and we'll we'll deal with that later if we got time. The the Cisco Spark one's the one that's going to be important for the lab. So as long as that one works, we're in good shape. All right. So we'll file a bug with our developer people. It's fun to be the uh, the educator. I get to just like find issues and like have somebody else solve them. You got a good test base. Though. Yeah, I know. We tested it out. It did not work. That's fair. Okay. How are we doing? This? Who still needs time? No, nope. all right, no hands. All right, so next step, let's join the Spark room for this lab. So now that you have a Spark account, you'll be able to join uh, a Spark room. Spark rooms are similar to like a Slack channel, if you're familiar with those. So if you go to this URL, I'll make it a little bit bigger, and just put your email address in. Yep. Okay, since you're using the term Spark now, I'm just confused with the question. Is this at all related to like Apache? Ah, uh, that's a great question. No, it's not. It had nothing to do with Apache Spark. Yeah, this is a Cisco Spark. It's a collaboration platform. It has nothing to do with big data, though I'm sure they're using some big data in there somewhere. Yep, collaboration utility. Yeah, we get that a lot. Yeah. I didn't name it. So if you go to https .io slash, and then it's a pound symbol, RKG, it's just random characters, and it does end actually in a dash, that'll take you to a page where you can just put your Spark email address in, and it will dump you into a room for this class, so I can see if I can find it. Oh, there's a few of you in it. All right. So this will help. So as I've got links or information during the lab, I can dump it into the Spark room so that you can grab it and go through on there. So that's the big purpose of, of doing this bit. Here. Price, I have the client already on my computer then. Yeah. It, if you have the client, you don't have to use the web. You can certainly use the client as well. Uh, you won't be able to find the room because it's not posted publicly. So if you go to this URL, put your email address in that your Spark account's with, it will just put you in it, and then that room will show up in your Spark client once you're once you're made a member. Um, it asked me if, I'm, if Cisco Spark is installed or not. So you can just say no. There is indeed a dash at the end. Okay. Yep. Threw me off too the first time I saw it. The prerequisites, the least interesting part of the lab. But important. Same type of thing. Right. <laughs> we are, and the memes have started. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> All right. All right. Who is still trying to get into the Spark room? One, is the URL not coming up for you? It did, and it brought me to already in Cisco Spark space. But I'm okay, then, then if you go to web.ciscosparc.com, 
you should see it in your client. So if I make this page wider, the full client will have a list of rooms or spaces over on the side. You should see one that says Pi Ohio 2017. And once in there, you can participate in the excellent random chatter. I got about 27 so far. Nearly the whole room. Right. Cool, all right, are we there? Anybody still need time? Yeah. All right, we're good. Wait, can you uh, show the URL for the uh, Git plugin? Yes. Okay. There we go. You know, I'll even put the, uh, the command in the Spark room so that you can just copy it. Half the reason for making you all join the Spark room. <laughs> Alright, so if you get clone, that'll pull it down and go through a map. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So once you clone it down, if you change into that directory that has all the code in it, you're going to see this set of files that are there. So let's talk through which, what we have and kind of how we're going to use them as we go through the lab. So these are not in the same order. These are the order from you. Yes, I'm question. Sorry, one more time on that URL again. Which I'm one? To the join? GitHub. No, the, I'm sorry, the um, GitHub, the Git clone. If you check the Spark room, I just I put it in the Spark room. Make it easier. Thank you. Yep, absolutely. So in here, in the order that makes it easier for me to explain, so notes.txt.sample is a, it's the file that we're gonna use for Scratchpad during the lab. So everybody can just do CP, copy, or if you're on a Windows machine or something else, whatever the equivalent on Windows is, to make a copy of notes.txt.sample to just note.txt. That'll be your copy, you'll put your own information in there on that side. Dockerfile.sample, as we get closer to the end, we're going to package our code up as a Docker image. That is a sample or the answer key for that part of it. So if anybody doesn't feel like typing a whole bunch, you can just kind of switch to that. Similarly, we have my bot underscore zero, one, two, and three. Those are step points in the lab that show the different end uh, styles. This is a Python uh, PyOhio session. So I'm going to actually encourage people to actually type the code where normally I just say grab it, copy, and paste. But if you do get a little bit type, set, uh, type tired, you can just find the answer keys in each of these solutions, and as we go through the lab, it'll say which code solution file to look at. Requirements.txt, right? Python people, those are the PIP requirements. Readme is just the standard readme and then the license for the file. So that's what you're going to see in there, nothing too terribly shocking on it. And so if I go over here, and I'm going to do my, like that big so you can see it. Copy. Note sample to notes.txt. And then I'm going to open up notes.txt. And when it opens, it's very short. It's just a list of export statements for all of the details about our bot that we're going to need. And we'll be filling in data into this file as we kind of collect it through the lab. Okay. All right. Anybody getting needs some help get stuck with where? What do you got? Uh, so it still says that. I'm already in Cisco Spark space, but my Spark is not showing up for room. It is not. I went back to the Cisco Spark.com. Let's try the equivalent of a web application of unplug and plug in your computer. If you log out of the web client, log back in. Let's try that first. You can log out under the gear and then sign out. Yep. I'm going to join the space using the Desktop application that I'm not, I'm not able to figure out how to do. So did you do the did you go to the URL dot the, the URL and put your um, address in? You'll you'll still need to do that. So So the, the space exists and it will let you join, but you do need to put it in. So if you go to that URL, URL.io, and then that's to bit and piece. It'll let you join. Once you join using this URL, you'll be able to find it in any client that you use, whether it's a web client, mobile phone, desktop client. Yeah, uh, I, I 
Did you find it? Okay, excellent. All right. So, does everybody have their notes.txt file open? Anybody stuck on that? We good? So the anatomy of a bot. So now we've got all the prereqs done, we can actually jump directly into the, to the, the piece that goes here. So you're all painfully aware of how hard technology is at this point. Let's sit back for a second and relax and just talk about how this works. And so the anatomy of how humans chat, right? We're all fairly familiar with this. We've got one person on one side. They use whatever their platform of choice is. They ask a question, hey, what is the meaning? And then somebody replies back and says, is it two, it's at 2 p.m. Right? Really simple, easy interaction. The point of a bot is usually to provide more context. So in a bot, we're simulating a human with code, but kind of a, a more robust, uh, full-featured human that's got all sorts of like other information that they're going to provide. So in this case, if we're asking a bot, when is the meeting, your answer might come back, hey, it's at 2 p.m., but it's with Hamlet, discussing his friend York's interest in joining the team. If you want to learn more about him, click here to see his LinkedIn profile. So you got the information that you're asked for, but maybe other information that you could be interested in. And that's a lot of the ways why these bots are being created by companies, is to try to provide that direct interaction, customer service support that goes through, leveraging all the capabilities that are there. So the next bit is notification for humans. So if someone sends you a message, how do you know? Well, most of us are using some sort of a smartphone, we get notification on our page, the notification indicates us that we, got, we had an incoming message, maybe I want to read it and do something with it, right? Bots need the same thing, right? The bot is sitting out there, it needs to know some way that somebody sent it a message that it has to react to. The majority of bots, including Cisco Spark, operate using webhooks. Anybody heard the term webhook before? I figured probably a handful. If you're not familiar with a webhook, really what it is, it's just an API call, a REST API call coming from one system to another. It's a notification mechanism. It's most often an HTTP post, a REST post request, that provides an indication, a notification that something happened. So in this case, the general format of a, a notification would look something like this. It's going to come through an app ID, identify what application, who is sending this message, where is it coming from. The data, right, so the data, the ID of the webhook, so in this case, it's the ID, the, the ID of the, uh, the message that came through, who sent it, and this came from Ophelia, and it was what room ID. So inside of Spark, every interaction space, whether it's a one-on-one, -on -one, I'm talking with you, or it's a gigantic space with hundreds of people in it, every room has an identification number. And that's what this is. This is the ID that says, in this bit of data blob, it says Ophelia sent a message to this room. If you want to see the message, go get it. This is the message's ID. Okay. And then it was an event. So the event, the kind of the metadata about the webhook itself is the message was created, and then the webhook ID is going to be listed there. This doesn't include the message. This is just a notification that says somebody sent you a message. Webhooks are used all over the internet. If you've ever done anything in continuous development, in GitHub is notifying Jenkins or Drone or Team City, that notification is done through a webhook. If you've ever gotten a notification in Facebook because something else happened someplace else in the world, those are all webhooks that go through. They use basically the same way. And we're going to leverage this technology for our bot code so that when we send a message to our bot, it knows to go get the message, read it, and process it. Questions? Spark Webhooks, as a development platform, has a REST API of its, of its own and has a full capability to create messages, rooms, accounts, teams, video calls, voice calls, like anything you can do, you can do through the API to some extent. You always put the, the, the caveat at the end of that. But we have a full suite of APIs, get, post, uh, put, and delete so that you can manage webhooks through API calls. Now, in a lot of cases, you would have to go in and register your own webhooks, set them up. One of the values of the bot library that we created that we're going to take advantage of today is it actually does all this for us. It uses the Spark API inside of the Python object code to go ahead and register the Spark webhook or the webhooks in Spark for us. We'll look at that once we have them created, but we don't actually have to go create them ourselves, but understanding what's going on under the hood, I'm always a huge fan of going on the piece. So the Cisco Spark bot library, this is what we're going to use. <laughs> it's actually a Python library that I built along with a couple other members of uh, the development, a couple other members of the Cisco uh, SE team to make this easier. Because we have a whole bunch of people at Cisco trying to build Spark bots for a whole bunch of things, and everybody was creating their own way to do it and spending a whole lot of time on all of the bits and pieces that had nothing to do with their actual project 
It had all to do with just how to stage your bootstrapping with your bots going. So we wanted to make it easier for folks. And so to do that, we created the Sparkbot library to quickly build Python, Sparkbots in Python. There are a handful of libraries uh, in, in, as part of the SDK that uh, Cisco offers for Spark. They're in JavaScript, Node, Go. You can do them in any language. Um, because it's based in a collaboration place, a lot of the, the, the initial development, the places that a lot of people are building these bots in, is something Java-related, Node, JavaScript native. Um, as an engineer coming with a, a background in Python, right, Python works for me. I hated Java. I'm not a huge fan of JavaScript either. And so I'd rather do it this way, as a lot of the engineers that we're teaching. It uses Flask as a web framework. We'll look at the code a little bit as it's under the hood. But basically, what we did is we took Flask, we extended it with all of the logic necessary for the bots that are in there. Under the hood, it's using the Cisco Spark API library, which is a, uh, a lightweight client for Cisco Spark to interact with the API. So you don't have to make native REST requests. It's just a Pythonic way to interact with Spark. That library is also available if you just want to do something other than bot creation. That's an open library you can grab. And then all that webhook setup nonsense is all handled automatically, which means this is the code necessary to stand up a fully functioning bot. And actually, there's code in here we don't need because what it's doing is just illustrating how we add new capabilities. So we'll, in, uh, from Cisco Sparkbot, we'll import Sparkbot. We then have to grab all of the details, like what is our Sparkbot's email address, what is its password, what is the webhook URL, like all that has to come from somewhere. We're going to use environment variables for that because it works really easy. It's a modern development technique to do that. So we're going to create a bunch of four environment variables that contain that information. Then we'll pull those into our Python code using the OS library. <coughs> we then, in this case, are showing how we create a function to teach our bot to do something else. So skip that for a second. But this line of code, it wraps, but it's really just one line of code, is creating a new bot object from Cisco Sparkbot, and then passing in all of the information that we imported. We skip this one for a second, and then bot.run. So functionally, you can get a fully running Python bot up and running in Spark with two lines of code. Create your bot, run your bot. You want to teach it to do something new, you write a function, define your function, have it do something, and then you just add that command to your bot. That's the basic process. Now, the code for Sparkbot actually came from an initial boilerplate for building bots that we created to help our SEs go through. And it was about 300 lines of Python code. You'd start with that, and then at the bottom of it, you would do like this and this. And so we refactored, right? Everybody here refactoring before? Write code the first time, realize how you wish you would have done it the second time, and then redo it. And so we refactored all of that boilerplate code into the Sparkbot library to make it this much easier as we go through on that. Questions? All right, and we'll get deep into this code as we go to build it. Yep. So, uh, say if, I build, if I'm building a block uh, for internal usage, what would the email address, like, I'm trying to uh, see the separation between building a block that's internal to the enterprise and making it available to the entire ecosystem? So the question was, that how do we build a bot used for internal, but in, you want to prevent it from being available externally? Great question. So because this is a cloud platform, just like any of the other ones, when you create your bot account, it exists along with everybody else's account in the world. But when you build your code on what to do when, when messages come through, you can filter and say, only respond if this came from my users in my domain. And you can just ignore the rest of them. It's just part of the response. It's the same thing that goes, right? Um, you've got, do you have a Facebook account or a Twitter account? Yeah, anybody can send you a message, but you can ignore them. Same equivalent here. You can build your bot just to ignore people you don't care about. Okay. Good question. Other questions? All right. So let's build a bot. We talked about what we're going to do. Now let's actually get started. So the first step is, um, other than the gentleman, if you're building on the internet in general, you can skip this step. But the rest of us need to get our bot up on the internet. We'll do that first. <clears throat> so anger. So what we're going to do, use NGRAC to do is to expose our bot to the internet. We don't have our bot running, so what we're going to do is we're going to prep the tunnel from the internet to our laptop on the port that we're going to run our bot for. And so in your terminal window, I'm going to open a new one. You can actually run NGRAC in the background, um, and that's fine. If you know how to do that, you're an NGRAC power user, feel free to go off script. I'm going to show this in a new tab so that we can kind of reference back to it a few times. So it's simple. If you put NGRAC someplace in your path, then you should be able to run this command from anywhere. 
If you haven't gone through that step, just go to the directory that you put ngrok in and run ngrok. You probably can't see this one. ngrok HTTP 5000. And this will stand up and start our tunnel. Now the command ngrok, the file we're going to, or the command that we're going to run, the application we're going to run, HTTP, we're building a tunnel for HTTP use. ngrok supports other, like just basic TCP, UDP sockets. You need an account for that. It's a little for lots of good reasons, but for HTTP, you don't need anything fancy. And then 5000 is the port on our laptop in our development environment that our bot is going to run on, is going to run on. Now we're based on Flask, so Flask defaults to 5000, which is why we're using 5000. You could certainly change that to whatever you want. If I have my tunnel up and functioning, everybody got that? Excellent. So I'm switch, so I switch back to where my code is at this point. And what I want to do, what I want to do, yes? Sorry, uh, could you, Ngrok, what was that? A couple of us don't have. Yep, it's Ngrok, that's okay. Raise your hand, please, don't, <laughs> don't fall behind. We got lots of time. Ngrok space HTTP space 5000. Yep, I can do that. That's a good point. I also put it in the spark room. Okay. Now in there, what you're going what you'll see in the output in the output from NGRAC is you'll see two forwarding addresses. You'll see one that starts with HTTP and one that starts with HTTPS. NGRAC's nice. It gives us a little bit of security in there. So I want everybody to copy the URL for HTTPS. All the way, all the way to .io. Just copy that, and then over in your your notes.txt file that you opened, paste that after sparkbot URL. This little notes file. This is going to be the information for our bot to go through. So I've taken the HTTPS address. I've pasted it next to sparkbot URL. You are welcome to use HTTP if you are less security inclined than I am. They both will work. We're not passing, at least by script, we're not passing anything super like secure through it. But if you want, uh, if you're going to be doing some secure information with your bot, um, gathering intellectual property, questions about your customers, you certainly want HTTPS for that case. <clears throat> Anybody not get NGROC, the tunnel up, found the URL? You good? Okay. All right, so now, yes, question. Wait, is it the forwarding URL? Yeah, the one, the one you want is the forwarding URL and the one that starts with HTTPS. It'll be uh, or some random numbers and letters, and then it'll end in dot and rock dot Okay? All right, so let's create a new bot account. And so what you created today, or if you already had it, was a Cisco Spark account for you, a place for someone to send you a message for you to, for you to send messages back from. Though you could certainly use your own account for this class, you probably want to create a bot account, something to represent that functionality. And so what we're going to do is we'll create a bot account inside of the Cisco Spark platform. And so we'll go to developer.ciscospark.com, put it into the Spark room. So developer.ciscospark.com, and then log in. I've already logged in, but up in the upper right corner, there should be a button that says log in. If in your browser session you're already logged into web.ciscospark.com, you probably won't have to put your credentials in. It'll just grab it and know it. So don't think it's black magic. It's just the lovely nature of web, like web protocols. You'll know you're logged in when you see either your avatar, if you would already had an account, or just kind of a shade, a shade symbol in the corner. while we're waiting for everybody to go through, if you're ever experimenting with the Cisco Spark API, the way that the API, Cisco Spark's API is done is not through username and passwords for authentication, it uses tokens, kind of an OAuth type of a framework. You can get your own personal token for making API calls or doing development by just clicking on your avatar picture in the upper right corner, and then you'll see my access token. Now it's longer than the 12 or so characters here, which is why I don't mind actually just showing the bit, but obviously you can double click on it, hit the copy button, it'll grab your full token, and then you can use that for the bits. 
Now those tokens do eventually automatically refresh, so building an entire code based on that, not a good plan, but if you're just doing some test bit using your own account, it's a great way to kind of go through and do that piece. Question? Uh, how do you set up something under your own API uh, without worrying about the token refreshing? So the question was, how do you set up something under your own API without using the token refresh? So if you're gonna do a piece like that, you normally do the same way you would do any web development, which is kind of where we're headed. So if I click on my apps and click the add button, you can see I have two options to add applications for Cisco Spark, an integration and a bot. We're going to do a bot, and in a bot case, what we do is we create kind of a sub-account for ourselves, which is another bot. It, it lets you interact, there are some differences, we'll cover a bit of those as we go through, but if you're building an integration, you wanna have your application leverage Cisco Spark in the back end, you build an integration which then goes through typical integration pieces. You would set up an OAuth application, you get a client, an ID and a secret, and you just build it into an authentication framework. And so when someone logs into your application, it uses the same refresh cycles to make sure your tokens are, are kept up to date. All right, which brings us along. So the next step is click on my apps and then click the plus button and then click create a bot. We're going to create our bot in here. So the bot account is going to be what we actually are interacting with. That's what we're gonna run our code. That's the identity as we go through on that. And so for the display name, you can pick anything you want that you want to go through. In this case, it's just the display name, the friendly name. So spaces are okay, all of those other bits and pieces. So I'm going to call mine Hi Ohio Chuck. Chuck. For the bot username, this is the identity. This is the equivalent of, of the username in the Spark system. You'll see that it's going to be suffixed with an at sparkbot.io. That's just a default domain that all bots are going to go through. This name has to be unique across Spark. So don't use the same one I use, or the whole lab is gonna get weird because we're all gonna be fighting for the same username at the exact same time. I'm gonna call mine Pi Ohio Chuck and see if somebody else has already done it. They haven't, excellent. The green check tells me, at least currently, that name is good. If somebody else steals it from me, I will find you. <laughs> And then the way that the bots go, um, it, it's required in the system. I don't know why we have this required, but it is. There has to be an avatar icon that goes with it. Do you have a favorite avatar icon available or a URL that you want to use? Great. If you don't, I set one up for you, so make this easier. And so it's, uh, so. and I'll put this in the Spark room in just a second, so don't worry about typing it live. If you copy and paste that, you'll know that it works if you actually see the DevNet logo show up underneath the icon. If the logo doesn't show up, you've got, we've got a typo or I typed it wrong. One of them. If you have a URL that you know is, it, there's no upload button, which is another thing that I filed an enhancement request for. You need, it needs to be available on a URL. It's highly recommended that it be a square image so it doesn't distort, and it has to be at least like 512 by 512. If you've got your own, by all means, use whatever you want but that tends to kind of slow down the process as we go hunting Google images. So I made one to make it easier. And those are changeable after the fact, so you can always change that. <laughs> Once those are in place, click the Add Bot button. It'll take just a second to process the ad request. And if we scroll down, what you'll see is the My Access token. The My Access Token is the token for your bot. This will be different than your personal access token because the access token in any API is kind of a combination of username and password. It identifies this bot to Spark. So we don't want it to be the same thing as us. We want it to be unique for our bot. So copy that. You can, I'm just using the copy button. And we're going to paste that back in our notes.sample next to Spark Bot Token. Okay. If you navigate away from this page, you will never be able to see that token again because of security. But you can always regenerate a new one. When you regenerate a token, it invalidates the old ones that are there. So it's always a good idea when you generate tokens like this. The same thing works if you've ever used an AWS token or API. You can only get it once. After that, you can only regenerate them. Okay, so we captured that. We now have our SparkBot token. 
For the SparkBot email, in our notes file, grab the bot username. This is the one that ends in at sparkbot.io. And then in the notes file, the last field we need is an app name. The app name is used in a couple of places in the library, but the fundamental one it's used is to create the name of the webhook that's generated. I tend to just name it the same thing as the username without the at sparkbot.io on it. Okay. So pi of IOG. So for, yep. Sorry, where do you get the first one, the sparkbot URL? That was from ngrok. So when we fired up ngrok, it's the HTTPS forwarding URL. So we've got four pieces of information. The SparkBot URL, as I just mentioned, is coming from ngrok. That's the forwarding address. That's a tunnel. It's, it's a way that we can send webhooks to our application. We have our token. That's the authentication information for the API calls. We have our username. That's the at sparkbot.io component from the Spark interface. And then the SparkBot app name, just a friendly name that we're going to use in a couple of places through the bot, most notably how we register our webhook. Okay? Four bits of information. Anybody still need time gathering in this? So with those in place, we've saved them, we've made notes of them where we can use them, but now we actually have to make them available inside of our terminal, inside of our, our running environment, so that we can use those in our code. And so there's two ways we can do that, the hard way and the easy way. I'm a huge fan of the easy way. And so you can, inside of your terminal, you could type, you could type export, spark by URL, export, like over and over and over again. But I was really kind of nice to everybody, including myself, when I created the notes.txt file where we're storing all the information and put it in the same format. And so it, once you save it, don't forget to save your notes.txt. If you just type source notes.txt, it will go ahead and inside of the running terminal, just this instance, so if you close this terminal, they go away and you have to resource it, it makes four environment variables available. And we'll test that by saying echo, Spark, I'll put this in the Spark so everybody can test it. If you echo Sparkbot one URL, you should get back your URL. It just verifies that the terminal environment variables are set up. Yep, question. How about for Windows? For Windows, I think it's still sore. Anybody, anybody, it's been a while. Set? All right, so you won't be able to do the, the fancy source bit. You'll have to, you can give another one or change it, and it's set. Just replace export with set. So it would be, I will make your cheat sheet. Normally, normally when I do this lab, I actually provide the laptops for it, so the Windows question doesn't come up. <laughs> Set to set them? Yeah. Okay. And you should be able to echo in Windows, right? Yeah. Surround it with percent signs. Oh, put percent signs around it? So it would be echo percent instead of dollar sign? Yeah. On both ends? We may have to change. If, if, how many other Windows users are there? Okay. So we'll, we'll we fix these on the fly as we go through. So echo. Oh, when you set it to? No, we need to work. The set is right? Yeah. Oh, set is right, okay. So it's just the other place. Yeah? Okay. Yeah, okay. I put it in the spark button. That should go through. Oh, no, we're losing more. Uh, we already got to the check doors part. We're almost there, I promise. That's okay. Go ahead. Publicly shame the, the people leaving. Alright, uh, how about my Windows or my Linux and Mac users? 
Is we in good shape? Yeah, good working? Good? Okay. We'll, we'll see if we can help with this. Do you need to update this? Yeah. Set. Yeah. Yeah, you'll have to you'll have to change this, change it from export to set and then yeah, so what about the source? Uh, yeah, I, how, is there an equivalent to source in Windows in there? You create a file, you want to source it. Just do them one at a time. Just change copy and paste. Change it back into the Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 I didn't think of the Windows users as far as I do a lot of other ones. The problem is, I, I've delivered this class like a dozen times. Most of the time, I, I'm giving the laptops to go through, so I know exactly what's on them. This is the first time I've done it with a bring your own device to form. So we'll, hope we'll get those. Alright, so for those that are, so that we can make some progress, and we'll, we'll pause again. We want to build our base code. So to do this, So what we want to do is we want to create a file called mybot.py. This is going to be our bot code. We did. Before we do that, I got excited because we, we lost the environment variables. So we've got um, our environment variables set up. The first thing, now we have to set up our actual Python environment to get ready for that. So um, I'm going to use a virtual environment for this case to go through on it. If you've got virtual environment, I highly recommend it. You're probably already in there um, on that side. And so what I'm going to do is create a new virtual environment, virtual environment, I'm going to call it VNV. And as I mentioned, this lab doesn't necessarily absolutely require Python 3.6, but the code samples are there. Python 3.5 or 3.4 would probably work. Python 2.7 does work, but there's one spot where the code is different because the URL lib changed. And if anybody is in doing this with 2.7, just raise your hand when you get to that point, I'll show you. But for me, I'm going to create it with Python equals Python 3.6. This is creating a new virtual environment. Does anybody not know what a virtual environment is? I'm happy to explain it while I wait for the command to finish. Right. Again, not surprised here. Normally, that's a question that people don't know. All right, so once that's in place, then we will pit, uh, activate it. Source, BNB, then activate. And then I will pip install r requirements settings. So if you look at requirements.txt, the only thing that's listed in there is the Sparkbot library. Now that Sparkbot library, like most Python libraries, use some, I'm trying to get to where I'm at. So these are the commands that are interesting right now. Is, is this part critical? Is it necessary that you have virtual you know, It doesn't have to be a virtual environment. You will need to do the pip install dash r though. Okay. So uh, the pip install the requirements file just has the Cisco Sparkbot library. That library then in turn uses the Cisco Spark API library to interact with the APIs from Cisco Spark. And that library uses requests and a few other ones to make record calls. Which is why when you do the pip install, you see a bunch of stuff install. It's just like most cases where you do a pip install requirements. You might only have two or three, you end up with dozens. Same thing here. So we go through on those pieces. So if I do a pip freeze, we'll see that I do indeed have Cisco Sparkbot. It's currently version 55B0. And then a handful of other ones. You'll see Flask. As I mentioned, the Sparkbot is built to, in, um, to build on top of Flask. It also has the Sparkbot API library requests and a few other kind of core cryptography libraries that are needed for API calls. So nothing too terribly unusual or fancy in there.
So these will work great on a window or a Mac or a Linux machine. The Windows machines might be slightly different commands to do some of these bits and pieces. But in these cases, these commands are going to create a virtual environment. Um, looks like somebody put a check mark in here, right? Source the virtual environment. Uh, pip install the requirements. The touch command on Linux or Mac will create an empty file, and then we're going to open that file. You just sent those messages yeah. to shop. Oh, that's what I was going to use. <laughs> <laughs> you got too many rooms. There, now they're in the, the room with all you guys. Thank you. All right, so those will go through on that. And then what I end up with. Oh, right. So I end up with an empty file, mybot.py. So this is what our boss is going to be creating. Yeah, he's loud. I could, I could hear it down the hallway. I was kind of wondering about that. All right, so this is the base bot. This is our first version of code we're going to go through. So let's take a look at it and see how it's going to work. As I've stated, this code exists in the code directory. It's my bot underscore zero dot py. If anybody wants to type it to practice your Python, great. You're going to see me as soon as I'm done talking about the slide, go through and execute my copy command so that I get these files in there. And so our bot, we will import OS. That lets us grab our environment variables that we set. We'll then, from Cisco SparkBot, import SparkBot so that we can create a new bot object. These four lines make available inside of Python as names the equivalent of all of the environment variables. So the way that we use it is os.getenv, and then in parentheses, you put the name, of the, Spark, uh, the name of the environment variable. The OS library in Python, if you're not familiar with it, is the way that you interact with the operating system. It's a handy library because that library in this code will work whether you're Linux, Windows, doesn't matter. Mac, it will go ahead and function and kind of operate the same way. Here, this wraps to four, or, uh, four lines, but it's one line of code. We're creating a new object called bot based on SparkBot. And we're passing in the variables for our app name, token, URL, and email. And then lastly, we're going to run our bot. Now that run command probably looks similar, familiar if you've ever done any Flask development because we're built on top of Flask. That's actually the dot run command is inherited by the SparkBot object from Flask directly, and so we use the same command. We're going to run it on 0.0.0, .0 and it's going to run on, going to run on port 5000. If you want to get frisky, you can change that from 5000 to something else, but then you're on your own to figure out all of the other steps you have to do to fix ngrok and all those other bits and pieces, so I highly recommend stick with 5000. So that's the code. And as I mentioned, I'm going to cheat and copy mybot0 to mybot.py. And voila, I have my code. See how fast I type that. Okay. So this isn't even going to be the Chuck Norris. What we're going to see here, this will be the uh, Chuck Norris doesn't type code, he just thinks it. The, uh, what we're going to start here is the base bot, so that we'll get it up. We'll go ahead and get our bot up and running on that piece. Okay. Anybody need more time to get the initial code in place? A couple. That's fine. Feel free to type or copy and paste. Okay. Any questions while we wait? It is. Yep. So if you've cloned this down or your, your pencil and paper. So once you're in there, um, I will actually take these slides and put them in the GitHub library or stick it in Spark so that you can follow along as far as that goes. But all the answer keys at each step along the way are included in the code library. Yep, absolutely. Okay. All right. Yep, and if you look in um, the code directory, my bot underscore zero, has this code if you want to look at it so you don't have to look up and down as you go through. Or you can cheat and practice Command C or Control C, Control V. Okay. Any questions on the code itself? I usually don't go through that, but again, this is a, an actual Python conference. So if you've got questions on the Python code, by all means ask those. This is fairly basic Python code, but if you're new to Python and just getting started, it can certainly kind of throw you off on seeing some of these bits and pieces. We good, anybody need more time still? Or have questions? All right, so let's go ahead and get our, yes.
should be able to highlight it. And then Command C should should work. Um, I, it, there must be something on your laptop. It's working. What browser are you using? That's the same one I'm on. So you're doing it the same way I am. Command C. Command V. Yeah. I don't know. Okay. All right. So the next step is let's go ahead and fire up and run our bot and see if it's working. Yeah. Question. Yeah, if you look in the Spark room, uh, you create a virtual environment, activate it, and then install the requirements, pip install dash r. And then if you just want to catch up real quick, just grab the mybot underscore zero. That's the exact same place we are in the lab. OK, perfect. All right, so let's fire up and run our bot and see if she's going. So if I run python mybot.py, what? I have. I must, yeah, I've got one running somewhere. Docker, yeah, there it is. Docker, stop. My bot. I was testing my lab. Everybody, if you ever teach something, it's always good to test in advance. I just never shut it down. That's better. All right. So I now have the bot running on my laptop, OK? It's just, as I've said several times, it's built based on Flask, so the output will look the same. We do see that we output the webhook ID if you want to go, if, if you're debugging or looking for other information, and we'll look at some of that in a little bit. But our bot is now running. So there's, now what I want to do is actually go and test and make sure he's functioning as expected. Now we haven't put the Chuck Norris in there yet, but we have the base, kind of the boilerplate Spark bot that's in there. And so if I go to, oops, go to the web.cisco Spark in here, and then in the upper corner, if you're not familiar with Spark, this isn't the most intuitive bit of the client, but this little plus button is how you create a new chat. And I'm going to create a chat with Pi Ohio Chuck. Oops. Pi Ohio Chuck. And I'm polite. I'm going to ask Pi, or I'm just going to say hello to Pi Ohio Chuck and cross my fingers. Keeping them crossed. I'll say it again just to. Nope, there it goes. Yeah, that, the first one doesn't always, I think it's the way the webhooks are generated with the code. Sometimes you got to send it twice. So I send it twice, and we get back the default help message from the bot. Okay? So he comes back and he says, Hello, I understand the following commands. So we didn't write code for this. This is what the, the Sparkbot library has that's in there automatically. Now, I'm interacting with my bot one-on-one. -on -one. Now, I mentioned there are a couple of differences between a bot account in Spark and a regular account, and one of them is the way that they interact and fire with webhooks. So here, inside of a one-on-one -on -one room, I can just send him messages, and I can test. So if I send slash echo test, it will work, and he should echo back test, and everybody should be doing the same thing on that. Now, we can go in and we can add our bots to a room. So I've seen someone's been trying to fire off some of the commands in here. We actually have to put the bots in. So in the upper right corner, everybody should be able to do this. You see the little uh, grid of dots. And you can say, go into people, and then add people. I'm going to add my Pi Ohio Chuck bot. You all are welcome to do that. And we can have them chat, though it might get a bit noisy and hard to find them. So for most of the testing, I recommend doing it in a one-on-one. -on -one, but we can do it in this way as well. Pi Ohio Chuck. So I've added him. The way that Spark deals with this, and it's for security and some logging pieces, if you put a bot account into a room, in order for the webhooks to fire, you actually have to mention the bot in there. So if I do at Pi Ohio Chuck, and then say help, it'll fire the web webhook and go off on that. The reason I have to mention him again is because this is a multi-person room. It's considered a, a, a larger space. And it's just functionally the way that the, the APIs are written and the integrations were written was that in order for a bot to receive a webhook from a multi-party room, they have to be mentioned in the piece. And you mention the at symbol, and then you start typing their name, and it'll filter through. And hopefully, as I went through, I've seen Bluebird. Where was mine? There he is. So here was mine. So I did PyOhio slash help, and it went through on that. Okay. If I don't do that, if I don't successfully mention them, if I just type PyOhio, 
Ohio Chuck Echo. I've got his name in there, but you'll notice it's not highlighted. It's because it hasn't been recognized that I've actually tagged him, and it's just kind of the way that it goes through. So in order in a multi-person room for a bot to receive the webhooks, they have to be explicitly mentioned. Now in a one-on-one -on -one room, that goes away. So if I just go back to my one-on-one -on -one room, I can again just say help, and they will go through and it will process successfully. Okay? That's unique to a bot account. If you were to create an account, a full-fledged account, and create your bot using that token and all the other bits and pieces, they would get every webhook for every message that was ever sent in any room that was going through there, because you can overwhelm your code like that. Question? So did you use your auth token instead of your bot auth token when you fired up your bot code? It sound, if it is, there's something responding on behalf. You probably used, instead of using the bot to code, you probably use the other one. So to fix that, go back into developers.cisco.spark. If you still have it open, just make sure you grab your bots token. Again, not the one that's in the upper left corner. Grab the bot, put it into the notes file, resource it, and rerun the code. And it should come up and start using for your bot. Uh, okay, so let's look at what's going on. So when I send the messages, if I go back to the, if I go back to the ngrok window, what you'll actually see here are the kind of the interactions that ngrok is getting. So every time I send a message, it's a webhook that's fired from Spark. Spark is sending it to the ngrok URL, which is why I see all of these 200 OKs, the posts coming through. And then what ngrok does is then forwards that to your code. So if I look at my running code, I can see them coming through here. So I would say, let's see where you're coming through. Do you see them on ngrok? OK, so in your, what I would say, do I output that? I don't. So inside of ngrok, what I would say is kill your bot, go back to your notes.txt, go back to notes.txt, and make sure the sparkbot URL is the forwarding address for ngrok. So put that in, uh, kill your, resource the file to reset the environment variables, rerun the, the bot, and you should start seeing the messages come through. Okay. Who, how many people got their bots to respond? All right, a vast majority. You don't have to. I was just showing the, the piece on that. If it's working one-on-one, -on -one, that's perfectly fine. Okay, question. Not yet. On Python 2, everything at this point should work exactly the same, but I will, when I get to the point where there is a change, I will mention it. What's, what's the error? Your, open up your MyBot. I don't, your MyBot code doesn't look right. Okay. All right, any other questions? Yes. In the status, let me see. Where's your developer window? Can you scroll down? Uh, it says the tokens there, so scroll back up. Copy that. Copy the bot username. I think you something went. Yeah. Yeah. Go back to web. Just do add. Paste it in. Try again. It's a yeah. Yeah, I think you had a dash instead of an underscore or something. Okay, anybody else have a question? Yes. So the question was, the name that I'm chatting with, the name or the email? So this is kind of like a lot of um, account type systems. Everybody has several things that identify you. So as far as Spark is concerned, the way that it's finding you is the email address. 
So it's whatever your bot is at sparkbot.io, right? So it, what it'll try to do though, so, so what it wants to chat with is the email. If you put in the display name, Spark will go looking through trying to figure out who you're talking about. Um, so, and that can be hit or miss. So I would say in that window, put the Sparkbot email and then hit the go chat and then you can send the message. Did you find it? Yeah, usually, especially if, you're, if you've got an account that's part of a, like a company, it's great about finding directory before if you've never chatted with somebody. When we're talking about these global bot accounts, sometimes you want to you have to put the explicit account that's in there. Okay, any other questions? All right, so we've got our bot running, and he's up and functional, but we're not telling Chuck Norris jokes, and I promise Chuck Norris jokes. So let's go ahead and move on from there. So the next step, is, oh, we did that. So let's bring on Chuck Norris. And so the way that we're going to do this is we're going to use, as I mentioned before, my favorite API, which is the Internet Chuck Norris database, icndb.com. And you can find information at it at www.icndb.com. Its API is available at API. It's an easy API. It's actually very REST-like. I use it for teaching APIs all the time because it goes through on that. So in this case, we're going to use it in that space. So the first step we have to do is we have to create a function that knows how to go get a Chuck Norris joke. And so we'll create our function, def Chuck joke underscore, and then in parentheses, message. Now what we're going to pass into this joke is the message that was sent to our bot. In this case, we're in this first version of the, the piece, we're not actually doing anything with the message that was sent, but the way that the SparkBot library is built, it expects a function to kind of, it's going to send the message at it. So we define our function. I'm using URL lib to make the REST API request. I'm doing that because I wanted to limit the, the, what it takes to do for this piece. You could certainly use requests or some other piece that's here, but in this example, I'm using URL lib. And then I'm importing JSON because the uh, API call is going to send the data, the joke back in JSON format. Everybody familiar with JSON? Yep, okay. So then we create a response object, URL lib .request .url open. It's a really easy API. It's just the host slash joke slash random. Give me a random joke back. The API supports all sorts of other options. You can actually sub out Chuck Norris with some other name. So you could actually put yourself into the jokes. Like it's a really fun API to work with. We're using a basic one here. We're then going to json.loads, the response, and then grab value.joke or value joke out of the, the dictionary that's sent back from the JSON and interpreted. And then we return the joke, which is just the text of the joke that goes through on there. This is the function code. You'll notice Python 3 up there. And it's because you are a lib change from 2 to 3. And so I'm going to flip this over. Um, in mybot underscore one dot py is this code if you want to grab it. Um, I don't have it subbed out for the 2.7, but I do have the code here. So if we look at what this code looked like in Python 2, I had to make these changes. Instead of importing URL lib, we're importing URL lib2. And then the response is URL lib2 URL open. And so for anybody using Python 2, I'm going to leave this up because I don't actually have this code in the, the repo because I ported the code all to Python 3 for actually just this past weekend for this class to go through on that. Everything else is the same. It's just the URL lib library changed here. I may actually in the future change it to request so that I don't have to have this bit that's different. Leave that for a second. Yep, question. So it's me it, we're not using it. So this function doesn't actually use it, but the SparkBot library, when we go to add this to the bot, it's going to pass in the message. So despite the fact we're not using it, we have to have the function has to support it. It's just it's the way, it's an intricacy of it. In the future, what we can do, and I have no idea if we'll have time today or not, what you can do is you can actually take the command to run this and then parse information from the message. So if someone wanted to see, really? Oh yeah, wow. All right, if someone wanted to uh, change out their name in Chuck Norris or pick a category, we could grab that info out of the message. It's just a very simple API call here, okay? All right, so we got that. So the next thing we have to do is, so we create the function and then we have to teach our bot how to call it. And so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to add bot.add command and then there's three parameters that add command needs. It needs to know the command that is going to listen. So what command are we teaching? We're going to teach our bot how to respond to slash Chuck. Remember, it already knows how to respond to slash help and slash echo. The help message, right? Get a random Chuck Norris joke. 
and then the function to call, which is chuck underscore joke. That's the function name that we created on the slide previous. And so I'm going to, again, I, this code, so the full code, the full working code is stored as mybot underscore two. So I'll grab that and put it into my code. So I'm going to kill my running bot, copy mybot underscore two dot py to mybot.py, and I get the full function that's here. Okay. And so what we added again, we created a new function called chuck joke, and we taught our bot how to tell a joke with the add command bit. Okay. We're at about 30 minutes, so at this point, if you're executing the typing, bravo. Uh, go ahead and use the copy command at this point so we can get them all working. Okay. So we've got our bot up and functioning using these bits and pieces. Okay. Any questions on the, the code that we've, we've seen here? All right. Save. So now that that's in place, the next thing that we want to do is we want to actually restart our bot with the new code that's there. So I already killed it. Yep, question. So the question was, are commands arbitrary or does it have to be slash in a command? It can be whatever you want. It's just a string. So the way that the, what the bot code is doing is it's, it's going to add into the, the bot dictionary the list of commands that it knows, slash chuck. I could put tilde chuck. I could just put chuck. Right? I use the slash notation because it seems to be something that a lot of bots are using and sticking familiar, but it could be whatever you want. And then the, the string that's here is just the help message. So remember, it, it responds back with a help message. So this is going to be what's inputted into the help message that's there. Yep. So the question was, if your bot is the only one in the channel, or in this case, a room, or a space is the Spark term for it. It's fine. No, no, I get it. It's, uh, you're not going to offend me at all. So the Spark has a concept of a room is either a one-on-one, -on -one, a direct, or it's a format with a lot. So if you, had a, if you built a room that was of a multi-party room, but the only people in it were you and your bot, it would still behave like a multi-party, and you would have to mention them. But if it's a direct message, then you don't have to mention them. It actually wouldn't let you message, mention them. So we've copied the code. Let me go ahead and run it. So I rerun. And when I go back to Spark and find my bot, if I rerun at slash help, I should now see a third command. Wow, he does not want to respond the first time, does he? Oh, I'm getting an error. Look at that. Unknown response code. Did they change the API? What? Did it work for somebody? OK, well, that's a good sign. Um, Spark API. Yeah. So this was, I, I got a note that they're actually doing Spark Cloud maintenance this weekend. And I, I tested it this morning, and we were fine. But it seems like we may be having some issues now. I don't. Still getting errors slash chuck. Crap. Who's who's is working? Now they've stopped. Killing my. What's the What's the where's the error? Debug on the fly. Trace back. Uh, flask. Ugh. What did they do to Spark? <laughs> ah, we were so close. Is is my other check mark box still working? So. Spark maintenance. <laughs> All right, we're going to pretend it was miraculous. Um, I have a working. I got a history for a working one. So we'll we'll go off script here a little bit and 
love the cloud and love live coding. So what it should have done is the new help message would have looked like this. We added a command called slash chuck. It gives us the help message that comes through here. And then by executing the slash chuck, it would use the API to go get a, a Chuck Norris joke from the API. It would then reply back in the Spark room for it, and it would go through on that. Um, hopefully, the Spark cloud will fix whatever the issue is here shortly, and they will start working. I'm going to plug ahead, because this is actually the end of the live coding bits, and we'll talk about the other bits. Question. So the question was, after slash cho chuck, would you put a message in? So if I put slash chuck and then something in there, that actually does get passed into the function based on the way that the bot works. But our code didn't do anything with it, so it wouldn't have any impact. Now we could. We could parse the message, and we could put slash chuck category equals nerdy. And then we could update the API call to go get nerdy jokes only. Like, there's lots you could do with it. Correct. Just the string, everything other than the command is all passed in, I think, the way, the way it's OK, so we've got those up and functioning on that. And that's a real bummer. Man. And when I saw that email this morning, they're like, nobody should notice a problem, the cloud. Nope. All right. Oh, that's a real bummer. OK, so let's, let's continue along. That's what it should have worked. All right, so we checked out our feature. We present. So look under the covers. Where are we on time? i got like 20 minutes. So let's look at a, a couple of bits and pieces. So if I go to, you just watch at this point. I'm just going to do a bit of a demo on how some of these bits work. So I clicked on the URL here, which actually just opens up the ngrok like, command window on our laptops. This would work for everybody. What's nice here is we can actually see the, you, the web hooks that are coming through. And so you can monitor those as you're troubleshooting them. So these indicate the contents of the web hook that was going through. And there's some flags you can turn on in the SparkBot code, where if we go through, and if I went into my code, and on the bot creation, I can add you, and debug equals true. And what the debug equals true statement does is, in addition to the logging that the messages come through, the SparkBot, the Python code, and, and it, it, instead of the stack tracing we're currently seeing, we would actually see the message output, the full JSON blobs, everything coming back and forth from Spark, so for debugging pieces. So that was built into the code to make it easier to debug. And then if we go through, actually, I'm going to skip the looking inside the SparkBot code because we won't have enough time for that. Um, but you're always you're welcome to, to go through and actually look at how the SparkBot object was created on that if you're interested in how we wrapped up all of the, we built on top of Flask, how we wrapped in functions to automatically create webhooks. All that code's available. You can go ahead and take a look at that on your own. So the next piece, right, I said Python, Docker, and Chuck Norris. So here's the Docker bit that goes through. And so let's take our code. We're currently running it just live on our laptops. That's great for testing, but that sucks for packaging, right? Packaging is all about how do we make them available. And so still fairly modern, or still a fairly current way to do this, because not everybody has fully adopted serverless architectures, are microservices and containers. And so let's look at how we would actually create a Docker image to run our bot code. And so if you go back to the command line, and I will kill my non-working bot, and touch Docker file. How many people have experience with Docker? A few. How many people have heard it but have never done anything with it before? Oh, OK, good. So let's, we'll take a look at how this works. So just like before, I have a cheat sheet for what the answer file is. I'm going to go ahead and copy it now so we can look at it. So dockerfile.sample. So dockerfile.sample is the answer key. And we're going, I'm going to open it now, and we'll talk about what's in there and how the Docker file works. So the way Docker functions is that it pa the whole point of a Docker container, or an LXC, or Rocket, or whatever container technology you're using, is to take your code along with any dependencies your code needs. And in Python, our dependencies are things that you would pip install, primarily. We package them all up in a portable object that can then be deployed anywhere you want it. And the way that you define and build a Docker image, which is the proper term for the template that you would then run a bunch of containers for, is using a Docker file called Docker file with a capital D. You can call them something else, but that adds undue complexity. I wouldn't do it. So Docker file. What the, the way this goes, it's a text file, command structure based. The first line is from. Like all good coders, we steal from other people. It's called borrowing or honoring those that came before. And so I didn't want to build my own base container to run a Python application when other people have done it for me, particularly the people at Python. 
So the people at Python have, have a base container, a base image that I can build from. They actually have a variety of them, depending on what version of Python or what base operating system or what you're trying to do. And so from Python 3.6-Alpine. Alpine is a specific kind of flavor of Linux designed specifically for containers to make them super tiny. Uh, tinier the container, the better. So I'm starting from a tiny Python 3.6 image. All that image knows how to do is run Python 3.6. And then from that, I build on top of it in layers. So the first layer is maintainer. I stamp it with my identity. Then I say expose port 5000. My code is going to run on port 5000. This container needs to expose it to the outside world. I then run a command, make directory slash bot. So inside of the container image, I create a directory called my bot where I can put my code. I make it the working directory. I add in the requirements file right, the Python requirements file, and then I pip install them to bring my requirements in there. By default, the, th the from image ran Python, has pip for me, right, they were at least nice enough to put that in there, but it doesn't have anything else. So I have to install my requirements with this line. And then I add my code, mybot.py gets added in. And then finally, the command is how I instruct Docker, when somebody starts an instance of this container, what do I want it to do? What I want it to do is to run my code. And so it runs the command python mybot.py. The syntax here is kind of weird. There are a couple of variations, but this is, I think, currently the recommended way by Docker on how to do it, is the way the command structure goes is they're parameterized. And it will take all of these and put a space between them. So if I had to run python mybot and then had a bunch of arguments, I would just kind of string them out in list array format for that. So this is our Docker file, and it will go ahead, and we are going to create an image based on that. If you install Docker for whatever your platform is, you can go ahead and follow along from here. If you don't have Docker running successfully, you can just watch, that's cool too. So I've got the, that piece in place. <clears throat> what I want to do is actually, do Ooh, I'm going backwards. So having the Docker file are the instructions, what I need to do is build an image based on those instructions. And so what I use is the docker build command dash t. Dash t is for tag. I'm going to name my image on my laptop. If you don't name it, it will name it, give you a unique identification. Those suck to work with, so name them. So my bot. And then dot. You actually have to end in dot. Dot represents the local directory, and you're saying where to go find Docker file. I'm running this from the same directory where the Docker file is. If I was running this from someplace else, I would do dot slash and then however, just a full path on how to get there but just dot because my um, code in the Docker file is all right there. I've run this before, went really quick for me. If you're running it, it may stall in, on step one, the from, because what it's doing is it's probably downloading the Python 3.6 Alpine image from Docker Hub onto your laptop, make it available there, and then it will build on top of it. As we talked about the Docker file, we talked about each line along the way, and I called those layers. And here, we can see the step indications for each of the layers as they go through. So step one, from our image. Step two, create a new version of it labeled with the maintainer. Then expose it. Each step along the way is considered a new layer in the image. And then at the final bottom, it creates the full container that's there. As you update code, and rebuild your container, what's one of the, the, there's a lot of really good things about Docker from a container perspective, but one of my favorites is it doesn't redo work it doesn't have to do. There's a science and art behind designing your Docker files, but in general, the things that will change the most often, you wanna put latest, because that is where it has to pick up rework. So in this point, I don't actually get to my code file till step eight of nine. So if I don't change my requirements, I don't update anything else, I'm just updating the code, Every time I docker build, it can just rerun eight and nine. Eight and nine, it's much faster on that side, okay? So I've built my c container. Is anybody else building still? Still building or did it finish? Still building, okay. I'm gonna go ahead and plug away. It should finish pretty soon. You still building too? Or is there a question? That's from the docker build command? Unable to, I'm not familiar with. Yeah, must be an issue, okay. All right, so we've got that in place. Now, the way that what we created was a Docker image. A lot of people say you created a Docker container. I'm usually not that pedantic about terminology, but I think it's important to understand some of the bits of differences that are there. 
A Docker image is a template. If you're familiar with a VM world, it's like a VM template, and then you clone it to create a bunch of running VMs. The Docker image is the template. When you run an instance of it, then you have a container as they go through on that. So what we'll do now is we're going to run a container based on our image. We're going to do that with the docker run command. I am going to copy and paste the command into the Spark room for the same reason we've done the other ones. Oops. And we'll look at it as we run it. Oops. We'll talk about what this command does too. So, uh, Pi Ohio. Okay. There's the command. It's, uh, it's wrapping, as you'll notice. I'm using uh, an end slash. It's one long command with a bunch of parameters. So let's talk about what they are as we go through. So clear. Great question. The question was, oh, docker rm. So the question was, where is the image stored? It's stored on your laptop. All a Docker um, image really is is a file and references. So when you do the Docker build on your laptop, it's storing it on that image on your laptop. If you wanted to make that image available up on Docker Hub for other people to use, there's Docker Push and other methods for that. I'm not covering that in the lab today. I have, I have no idea. It's wherever Docker puts stuff. And I don't have to know. You probably don't either. Yeah, it's wherever in your file system, Docker is like storing stuff. Okay, so Docker run. So the Docker run command that's up there, it has, yep, has a, has a bunch of bits that are in there. So Docker run dash dash name. I wanna run an instance of my container and call it my bot. If I don't give it a name, it will create one for me. And those are actually kind of clever and fun to look at, but in general, it's easier just to give it your own. These dash E's each indicate an environment variable. So we had to create environment variables for the token, the URL, all of that information. Docker needs those as well. And the way we do those is pass, the way we set Docker environment variables inside of a running container is using the dash E on the Docker run. And so what we're doing is we're creating inside of the Docker uh, running container a, a, a variable called sparkbot URL, and we're setting it equal to the same sparkbot URL that's local in our terminal. So we're just passing those into the Docker container for all four of those. Dash P is how we set a port. So I run the container. If I want that container to serve something, I need to map the port of the container to a port on the host. That's this dash P5000, 5000. Dash D is for daemon. It says run this container in the background rather than in the foreground. And then finally, what is the container image I want to run, which is my bot. It spits out a long identification. That's the running container ID. It's a unique container ID to indicate this container and she's running. Now, I have no idea if Spark is working again, but let's test it. Slash help. Didn't reply. Now, the next step on this anyway was to look inside it. So I have a running container on my machine. When I ran the Python code, like I could see the stack traces. We can do the same thing with Docker by doing Docker logs, my bot. Oops, it's running. <laughs> So there's probably some outages on Spark right now. All right, so we'll pretend, oh, no, it's still Docker logs. You can follow them with dash F. Wow, they are taking longer, so it's really busted. Yeah. Look at that, okay. All right, we will, oh, there they go, Spark APIs. I can't wait to dig into that. There's all sorts of emails floating around Cisco right now. I guarantee it. All right. So we have our, our, our container running. Normally, our bot would be responding back with witty Chuck Norris jokes that I cross my finger every time that they're not too dirty, which would result in an email to my boss and then a justification with HR. I could avoid that by having it busted, so there's a plus sign. So here's a couple of pieces. So I just ran the docker logs command. That lets you get in and look at the standard out and standard error logs that are going through. So docker logs those for us. If you're doing this in production, there's all sorts of ways to kind of grab those pieces, put them into a logging centralization system, log stash, elasticsearch, all that stuff to visualize. But for development purposes, just docker logs let you look at them locally. Docker ps, right? We've got the ps command in Linux just to look at the processes, Docker PS will list you the different Docker images or containers that are currently running in their status. And then Docker options for lifecycle, stop, start, and RM. Stop will 
do as clean of a stop of that running instance of the container as possible, but it's still there. You've probably all heard the purpose. Docker containers are ephemeral. You start one, you delete it, they go away, they start up fresh. Though true, you do have the ability to start and stop a container and maintain it in its piece. So if you just stop and start, all of the logs, everything that's there will, will stay the same. If you docker rm, that deletes an instance of that container, in which case if you then docker run a new one, now you have a new one on that. So there's a little bit of kind of devil in the details when we talk about docker containers. So if I come over here and I docker stop my bot. Docker stop will take a second because it's actually trying to stop it cleanly. You can also docker kill, which is less clean but much faster. And then if I do a docker ps, ps only by default shows running containers, so I don't see any. If I docker ps-a and then grep for my bot so I don't see all of the garbage in history, We'll see that it's there, and it shows its current state is exited four minutes ago, and I could docker start to restart it up again if I wanted to start it back at its same state. Okay, any questions on the docker bit? All right. So we did run out of a bit of time on here, which is actually fine because Spark is down anyway, which would make this part of the mission really hard. But if you wanted to go through and kind of practice uh, later this week or someplace else, you have the code. You can always restart it. It's your bot. It's your account. So this. This lab doesn't end when, when the piece is over. You can always extend and use this technology. But for some ideas, one of the instructors, Kenneth Lowe, yesterday said, new coders need ideas, things to do. So if you want to build on the skills that we talked about today and teach your bot to do something else, anything with an API or that you can do in code is possible. So some examples of things you may want to try. I'm a, a big fan of, of having fun with technology, especially when you're just getting started and learning. So I've also built a cat fact bot because the internet is for nothing other than cats, I think. And so teach one that will tell cat facts, which is also a good one to go through to practice another API, see what's out there. It's actually several that'll give you cat facts. Famous quotes, weather details, information about GitHub repos. There are APIs freely available for all of that information that you could replicate the same thing we did with Chuck Norris, but for any of these other functionality. Some harder ideas, build a hangman game. Right? Now you have to deal with state. Somebody starts a game, it picks a word, it remembers letters that go through. Great project to go through on here, and fun to do as well. Or a guessing game, right? 20 questions with a spark bot, same type of idea. Lots of cool stuff you can do. When you take this into your technology, so when I deliver this with, uh, a lot with Cisco engineers or folks trying to do this, I then go into how would you use this for wor real world. I deal with a lot of network engineers, right? Build a bot to go query the status of your firewalls. Build a bot to go query the health of your running systems and application. The options are endless to go through on this. And when you start building bots to do parts of your job to make it easier, now we have chat ops, and we've gotten even cooler than DevOps. All right, so closing and review. I'm, I'm still good, right? 20? 20 after? So closing and review. What did we do? We learned what makes up a bot, right? So we learned the basic pieces. Doesn't matter if it's Spark or Slack or anything else. We deployed a fully functional Spark bot, and it did work. Thank God that the, the Spark cloud didn't crash like right at the beginning of the class. So we all got them somewhat working. We then packaged our bot as a Docker, which still did work. We were able to fire it up, go through on that. We looked at some of the basic Docker lifecycle commands. We added a completely new feature, uh, which was the Chuck Norris bit. You've got some ideas of other things that you can add from there as we go through. So a couple of bits as we go through. I'll stick around for some questions as we go. Oh, uh, what else did I have? Uh, you can learn more, right? So if you go to uh, developer.ciscospark.com, we were there already. You can get documentation on the full APIs. Learninglabs.cisco.com has several labs about using Spark, building integrations, using OAuth, all of the other stuff you might want to do so you can get more information. And then up on GitHub under Cisco DevNet slash awesome Cisco Spark are a ton of libraries, things to make it easier, all sorts of bits. Um, I will post these slides into the Spark Room that hopefully you're all a member of so that you can get access to those as well. I'll also keep that Spark Room open probably indefinitely if you have other questions or have other bits and pieces to go through on there. So feel free to use that if you want to uh, get in touch with me. That's the fastest. And I think I have my other contact info here. Yeah, if you do have other questions, uh, if you're not an active Spark user, you can get me in other areas. I am on Slack. Um, I use Spark much more often, so if you're looking for me, Spark or Twitter are easy ways to grab me. You can follow me on GitHub at slash hpreston. I occasionally post something that's somewhat useful. 
You can follow all the Cisco DevNet pieces that are here as well. Um, I will stick around as I'm packing up on that. As I mentioned, I have a few shirts up here. If you register for a Cisco DevNet account, send me a Spark message or just tweet me showing that you're there. We'll actually ship you uh, your own because I only have like five of them up here of varying sizes. So show me your API and I'll show you yours. We got some cool there. And because we all like stickers and development, I've got a whole bunch of them here. Spark account, some DevNet ones. Um, these are some of my, the, the new favorite ones, API Girl, advertise those. We've actually created a, a full suite of uh, development superheroes led by our fearless Captain Cloud. So I've got some decent swag that's up here as well that people can grab. Any final questions? Yes. Yeah, the question was, does Spark host bots for you? Spark doesn't. It's a, it's a platform. You can host your bots wherever you want. We have lots of bots hosted in AWS or Google. There's a couple of projects. If you go to ciscopipeline.io, it's kind of a skunkworks project from one of the engineers at Cisco for a bot hosting platform. But basically, you can run it any place that's accessible on the internet. We, don't, we decided that it didn't make sense for us to say, run your bot here. Just run it anywhere you, can, you want to. Uh, question. I will, I will post the slides in the Spark Room. So as soon as I'm done here, I'll, I'll zip them up and just post them in the Spark Room. Oh, okay. All right, it, it, the Pi presentation will also be available on the Pi Ohio website as well there. Okay, yes. Other platforms other than Cisco Spark? I mean, there's, there's bot platforms out the yin-yang these days. If there's a messaging platform, you can build a bot for it. Facebook Messenger, Slack, obviously. Um, I'm drawing a blank on other messaging platforms right now, but there's tons of them. If there's a, if there's a messaging platform, you can probably build bots for it. Just, pardon? Yeah, so the advantage of the Cisco Spark platform is Cisco Spark was built, like most of Cisco technology, around the enterprise use case for collaboration. And so integrating this with the rest of your collaboration technology, voice, video, meeting services, um, it, we've got full security baked in with key exchange. So one of the big things with messaging platforms is I want to secure it, but I want to own my own keys. We support that rather than hosting keys for you. We can do that too. So there's a lot, of, it's, it was built from the design up to be secure um, and kind of targeting at the enterprises. I, I probably have like one more question. I'll keep taking questions, but we'll have to, we'll have to cut the recording off in just a minute. So what's your question? Yep, I will dump that. I, I'll put all the URL and stuff information in that Spark room. You don't have to keep Spark open forever, but if you keep it open for the next couple of hours, I'll dump some information in there. So for, for some of those basics. Do we have what? Giphy integration, I don't know. Yes, um, we probably, I know people have written them for them. If you go to Spark Depot or integrations, there's tons of ones that are there. Yeah, I'm sure there is. I just don't, there's been a ton. All right, we're starting to filter up on this. Thank you.